Thursday, November 17th, and this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we talk about how not to suck at college. Let's, let's do, do this. this. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, let's do this. It's pretty relevant to my thing of the day. Oh, really? Really. So, um, you know, Microsoft has their little advantage thing that makes sure you're not pirating and such. Yeah. You know, with their Windows update and whatnot. Well, they, they changed it so it works on Firefox now. You know, that kind of makes sense, considering that Firefox has hit, what, the 10% mark? Something like that. But, I don't know, it's like, wouldn't they still want to force people to use the IE, which is what, it's like too little too late. It's like, if oh, you would have done... Uh, if you, <laughs> I think too little too late applied five years ago. Well, yeah, but it's like, alright, if you would have done this, you know, years ago, then uh, IE would have been dead by now, but doing it now kind of doesn't really help you, you know? yeah. Because anyone who's not going to use IE already isn't using it, and I don't know. There, it's not going to help Microsoft. It, you know, it's not going to give anyone a better impression of them. And because I saw that they also made a Windows Media Player type plugin for Firefox. Really? Yeah. I thought that was just something they were going to do. They're going to do it. I don't know if it's finished yet. Yeah, you can get it if you're in that beta program. Just like you can see, you can play with Office 12. I don't even know. I, I have I use Firefox, and I, I have Windows here, and Windows Media Player is in it just fine, and I haven't installed anything special. Huh? See, I don't really look at media at work, and work is the only place in the world I use Windows now. Yeah, I, I only I look at media on my work laptop, which is my only Windows computer, and it, it happens. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, EMI claims that Apple is going to change iTunes to benefit them in the way that they've been screaming about for the last, I don't know, year. I don't know about this story, because a, a little while ago, didn't we see the story where Steve Jobs pretty much said, no, no way I'm going to do this, and he gave the record companies the finger? But I also point out that right before the uh, iPod video was released, he said that they would never make a product like that. That's true. Hmm... Yeah, but apparently they're going to – they claim that Apple is going to get rid of their every song is 99 cents no matter what policy and replace it with a songs that are more popular cost more money policy. Oh, well, I think they're also going to do a songs that are less popular cost less money policy. You can't get much cheaper than a dollar, but you can get a lot uh, more expensive than a dollar. You know, a dollar, when it comes to me, no matter what song it is, that's way too much money. You're going to have to charge me – if you want me to pay for MP3s – you have to first, you have to make it so much more convenient than any P2P network ever has been. I need, like, a full, correctly indexed music library that includes everything I could ever possibly search for. And then it has to cost, like, ten cents a song. See, the, the thing cents. is, I think that in general, prices are going to go up as a result of this and not down. And I think that um, piracy is going to go up and purchases are going to go down. Ah, piracy. The cause of and solution to every intellectual property problem. Arrgh. The mateys. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's just so dumb. I, I think what people are also worried about is that the prices will change, like, on the fly. Like, if a song that's, like, so low and ancient, you know, but no one cares about it, it costs, like, ten cents. And but then, then if people, people start, start downloading buying it, it and they just jack up the price. Huh. The thing is, I don't see Apple doing any of those things. Why not? They're not Google. They're not, you know, immune to evil. Because I think Apple at least understands how fickle people are. And they're only using iTunes because it currently provides the exactly what they want, or at least enough of what they want to use. The minute iTunes goes bleh, I think a lot of people are going to jump ship. But here's the thing, is that, you know, iTunes is only what it is because all these record companies still give their music to it. And... You know, Apple really doesn't have a lot to say, and they don't make, you know... However, Apple has the power of saying, fine, don't play by our rules, you're not on iTunes. No, then... that's the other way around. The the music people say, fine, don't play by our rules, we'll take our stuff out of iTunes, See? making iTunes but it useless. goes both ways, because unless a bunch of labels all say they're going to pull out, if one label pulls out, they just miss out, and all the other labels profit more. No, because people stop using iTunes, because the point of using iTunes is that it has... Not only is it a dollar a song, which is... I guess good as far as some other people who, you know, buy music online consider it. But it has all these songs. It doesn't have enough songs. It doesn't have even. It doesn't have anything I want to listen to. Yeah, it doesn't have anything I want to listen to either. By my standards, it is crap. 
but by people who listen to pop music standards, it has like ten times as much as any of the other pay music download services, except for maybe all of it. Yeah. MP3. So if it dropped to having nine times as much, and it's still so much cheaper and better. No, it would drop to having like one tenth the amount it has. No, nah, because I don't think I think EMI, if they pulled out, I don't think anyone would uh, follow with them. You know, you realize there's only like three record companies. That's like a third of the music is just gone. Yeah, I don't think that'll happen. I don't know. Of course, apparently it looks like Apple is, if this article is to be believed, Apple's going with it and raising their prices. Yeah. You know, there was a contradictory article a week ago, so we'll just have to wait and see till that actually happens. And well, then discuss whenever there it are again. contradictory articles, I generally go with the newer one. Yeah, that's it's one way to go, but uh, I don't know. These article, This article seems to be a little more hearsay than the previous one. Because the previous one was, like, from the Steve Jobs mouth, and this is, like, from a guy who heard a record company guy. And I trust Steve Jobs' mouth a little more than a record company guy's mouth. And a Actually, guy who no, this listened... is uh, the head of the EMI group, Alan Levy, who yeah. said this. So a big Jew, we can trust him. Alan Levy, yeah. <laughs> and once again, Steve Jobs, what was the quote? Uh, why would we ever make a uh, video iPod? There's no such that thing was as also... headphones for video. Yeah. You know what? They didn't really. They didn't make a video iPod. They made an iPod that happened to have video. Yeah. It, it's actually kind of different than a special video iPod. You know. See, I think the moral is that these people lie, and until they actually have a press conference, we can't know. Yeah. But you know what? They could. You know be? what? You know what it really says? It was a slow news day today, and this is all I could dredge up. You know what it could be is that they say both things, and they want to see what the reaction is, and then they decide what to do. Yeah, but that doesn't fit Apple, because by the time he said it, it was too late, because they'd already produced the uh, new iPod. Hmm. I don't know, maybe that's why they like to keep the secrets, so that they can, they, if they keep everything secret, or at least technically secret, then whatever they do, for real, you can't say, oh, you didn't do what you said, because they didn't say anything, it's all secret. And then uh, they could just look at what the reactions to all the rumors are, and then decide what to do. But... They had already decided to make that new iPod, and then he said they're not going to make know, it. The, the iPod's really simple looking. How do you know they didn't design it in like five minutes right after people said they wanted it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Apple, uh, there's a rumor going around that we'll have the iBooks with Intel chips in January. Ooh. And the additional rumor is that it will be like $200 cheaper than the current iBooks pricing. So it's still far more than I'd ever pay for a laptop. Yeah, still. Well, these aren't the power books. These are the iBooks, the cheaper ones, the plastic, not, uh, not the not the powerful titanium ones. Even so, I can get like an old Pentium two or three, whatever, for a couple hundred bucks. You mean one where the battery only lasts five minutes? That's fine. No, no, it's not really. Because the the only laptops that I want are the ones that I can't afford, like those uh, life books. It's not so expensive. It's more expensive than an iBook. Yeah, yeah. By a lot, like by a thousand dollars almost. But I want that. I don't want an iBook. Well, hey, you know, small stuff is expensive, especially in the – well, even in, in Japan it's expensive. It's just more expensive here because you have to get it shipped But if I live in Japan, I wouldn't need a, na a notebook. I'd just have a cell phone <laughs> with a basic plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm actually going to try to get a cool phone soon. Uh, I'm looking into some options. But I don't know. It, it's kind of weird that they put out the iBook with Intel first because – the power book is really what needs the upgrade that people want, and this tells me that they don't have the powerful Intel chips, that they only have weak ones, and that p things that are more powerful than the G5 that are x86 are, like, not ready hey, yet. They're the ones who wanted to drop PowerPC, which is very powerful, so uh, they're going to have to deal with that. Yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what comes of it. I don't know how good the iBook's going to sell. People want power books, and they're going to hold out until they see them. Yeah. I just think it was funny because way back when Apple was pulling out and stopping, the, they said, we're not using PowerPC anymore. And I work for IBM. And I was like, oh, would that be bad? Uh, what are we going to do? And then I found out that everyone in the world buys more PowerPC chips than Apple. Yeah, PowerPC chips are a lot of things you don't expect. Yeah, like uh, the Xbox, PlayStation 3, and the Revolution all use the same chips, basically. GameCube has it. Yeah. Um, a lot, a lot of just random devices that you don't even know have it. You know, there's a lot of Motorola PPC chips and just random devices that you don't even know. Yep, because PowerPC is good. It's pretty powerful. It uses almost no power compared to an Intel chip. Mm -hmm. The assembly language is much better than the x86 assembly language. Yeah. 
it's, it's just a much better CPU architecture. It's just that the people who produce the chips won't produce them in quantity or style that Apple got, wants, I guess. Yeah, I'm not. We're real, I mean, no one really knows exactly why Apple switched. Uh, the rumor I heard was that uh, IBM refused to make one that was less powerful because they produce ones for their big giant supercomputers, and to also produce ones that are low power and slower for cheaper iBooks and things would cost them too much money to you know diversify the manufacturing. Yeah, I can't really say anything about that. I mean, they're all made in my uh, in the factory I work at. And I actually do kind of know the answer, but I really can't talk about it. Yeah, uh, that's what I heard. Yeah. Uh, don't take too much stock in that rumor. Uh, oh, well. Anyway, uh, now that it's, you know, MS Apple Day, um, <laughs> apparently some of the Microsoft programs coming out in the, in the future are going to be 64-bit only. Great. Uh, I wonder how many people are actually going to buy a 64-bit PC? Well, I think basically what's going to happen is that people buying people who are using have Windows networks already and who are already Windowsed are go when they buy a new machine now, a new server, a new something, they're going to buy one with a 64-bit chip in it and they're going to throw down some Windows on it. And that'll be good for AMD because they'll probably make a bunch of sales cuz I don't think the Intel, no one's in their right mind would buy an Intel 64-bit <laughs> chip. But I also think it's going to screw MS because people who want to upgrade the software, but then someone tells them, oh, you're going to have to replace your whole server with one with a 64-bit chip, are going to say, screw you, and they're not going to get the upgrade. And Microsoft makes all their money by selling the next version of something to people to yep. keep them in their cycle Well, there's also upgrades. the factor that for the first time ever, the new Office, at least, is pretty radically different in terms of GUI. Oh, well, they, they have their ribbon thing, and I think... The, the idea is the ribbon thing is going to be all over Vista. The thing is, I have a feeling that a lot of people who use Windows are kind of afraid of change like that. You know, you think that too, but have you actually seen this ribbon thing? Actually, yeah, I have. And it's, it's kind of okay. Kind of. And I think that people could figure it out after like a few minutes. Yeah, it's not a matter of figuring out. It's a matter of I see people being intimidated by it. Hmm... I mean, I see a lot of Windows users who are really intimidated by OS X in general, just looking at it, they're like, wow, what do I do? There's, it's it's different. Ah. Well, you know, they're just dumb. But I think that this thing, it doesn't actually change the way you use the computer. I mean, you still have the menus up there, right? And it actually takes away some of the intimidation because you don't have big menus with a million options in them. Yeah, but instead the menus change depending on what you're doing, too. Like well, the, like it's the, basically the same as having a menu, except, you know, if you're doing something, the things that you're most likely to, you know, click will appear in the ribbon, and the ribbon changes. Yeah, but we'll see how well that actually works. I mean, That's, I've seen it, but I've never used it, and I've noticed that... Microsoft programs in the past have been very bad at predicting what I'm actually going to do. Yeah, that's the big problem I'm thinking of is that, okay, so let's say the most the, the most likely thing I am to do is save, copy, paste, cut, and insert an image, right? So those are all in the ribbon. When I want to do something else, it's gonna, I think it's going to be a huge pain. Yeah. It's, and it's going to frustrate a lot of people because it seems like everyone who uses Office does one weird thing. Like, yes. they're a mail merge guy, or they're a random Excel script guy, or they're a, you know, they have one quirk, and everyone has a different quirk. And all those quirks are going to suck, and everyone's going to have one sucky experience. Yeah. And I'd say, oh, maybe it'll be, it'll push some people toward uh, open office, but as much as I love open source and open office, open office is slow as shit. That's why I don't use open office, I use Abby Word. Yeah. Abby I Word use, is fast. Uh, it just doesn't have all the crazy features of OpenOffice. And I use MS Office Word. 2000 because I acquired a copy. No. I use Abby Word. It's real simple. All it does is type, bold, italic, underline, formatting of paragraphs. See, the thing is, I don't even really use an Office suite on my home computer because Me- my old crap printer eventually died. I never bought a new one. Any like document editing I do is usually digital text type documents, and I just use VI. Yeah, I use VI mostly, but Abby Word isn't even an office suite. It's just a word processor. Yeah, I just have very little need for a word processor at home anymore. Yeah. I, I sometimes like to use it if I'm writing something, not editing a text file, because it's it's nice to write paragraphs of text in. Yeah, yeah. 
And um, thing is, whenever I write something, I'm usually writing it for a website, and I just have extensions in Firefox that let me do all the Officey type stuff in it, like spell check and uh, add HTML automatically for bolding and stuff like that. That's all good, but you know, I'm on the train. Oh to... ah, yeah. What are you writing a novel? No. And what are you writing? Stuff for websites. Ah. But you can't exactly visit the website to type in the text box. You have an air card. No, I don't. Oh, they took it back? They took it back a long time ago. Oh! <laughs> and then they gave me, they got these free singular ones, but they only lasted a month, and then that was that. And the singular one is not as good as the Verizon one. Uh-huh. And it's 20 bucks more money. Awesome. So if you're looking for a PCMCIA card to get you on the internet, get the Verizon Evdu for 60 a month. <laughs> It's it's the best in the U.S., even though it's crap compared to the rest of the world. Complete crap. All right. Things of the day. Thing of Things the day. of the day. We have no music. Yet. Yeah. Because we're still lazy bums. So uh, my thing of the day, I have always been kind of interested in lobotomies. Why were you interested in lobotomies? I'm not sure why. It's one of those weird... Not lobotomies as in current use or anything like that. Just the they history still use of them? it. Uh, yeah, but not in the same way they used to. Thinking about getting one? Nah. See, there was a period in the United States where there was a doctor by the name of Freeman going around. And he was lobotomizing people left and right. Thousands and thousands of people. He would do it in like five minutes with an ice pick. They he just hit people in the head with an ice pick. He would just he would lay you down. He'd use electroshock to knock you unconscious, and then he'd shove an ice pick o- like above your eye. It's called a sub uh, uh, orbital lobotomy or something like that. Take an ice pick. He'd shove it over the top of your eye into your brain, and then you swish it around. That's all he did, and he did it to thousands and thousands of people to cure various uh, psychological ailments. See, this is why people like Randy are out and about. Yeah, this guy did a lot of bad, and he did lobotomies on a lot of people. That's worse than any chiropractor I ever heard. Now, uh, one person who he did this to back in the 50s and 60s, it was done to this little kid. And the kid, luckily, wasn't turned into a complete vegetable, and he's still alive today. And he talked to some reporters, and he had a thing written on how he was lobotomized by this crackpot asshole back in the day. What's he like now? He's a pretty cool guy. He's campaigning against uh, this sort of quackery. Well, I don't think this quackery is happening. This particular quackery no, no, is happening No, no, but, but other much, instances you know. of this quackery are definitely happening. Oh, really? Where? The uh, people still lobotomying? Uh, actually, not specifically lobotomy, but now they've moved to various uh, antipsychotic drugs or mood-altering drugs that are really just as bad. Yeah, I'm not a fan of those. Especially the the parents giving them to their kids because they don't raise them right, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, the worst part is, from what I gather, the reason this kid's mom had him lobotomized was because, for, according to what physicians said, he was a normal boy, and the mom couldn't take it. So she got him lobotomized to quiet him. Sounds about right. Yeah. Just back in the day, they didn't have the Ritalin. Yeah, so they just stuck an ice pick into your brain and swished it around. Ritalin's not that much better. <laughs> it is better, though. So, my thing of the day, well, first of all, I don't like the MMOs. You should know I don't like the MMOs. He really doesn't like the MMOs. I mean, I got my fix back in the day, and, you know, I I decided that paying to click a button and make a number go up and chat with people with pictures... Oh, you mean progress quest? Yeah, is not uh, something I want to do with my life. And I don't like the TV either. If you know me, you know that I haven't watched TV really in... Years? Six years? Seven years? Since right about when we went to RIT. Yeah, since I got to college, and I'm out of college now for half a year almost. Yeah, we don't even have More cable. than half a year. Even though, it, despite the fact that Comcast thinks we're stealing cable, they, and they think keep coming and checking. It's not Comcast cable vision. Oh, whatever. Anyway. Cable C-Star. But today, there was something so cool on television involving MMOs that it got onto the internet. And, um... In fact, we have a clip, don't we? We do have a clip, and... It is awesome. So, uh, without further ado... This role-playing game, out in 2004, returns to the world of Azeroth, where heroes like Leroy Jenkins do battle. And that would be the world of Warcraft. Leroy Jenkins! Oh my god. So, 
either the guy who uh, writes the questions for Jeopardy is a mega nerd, or... One of his friends preyed on the fact that he's not a mega nerd? Yeah. What really got me, though, is normally you'd expect no one to get the question right, as no one got the question right. But yeah. this, this was the college edition... So you think they'd all get the question right. <laughs> you, you got to be a nerd to get on Jeopardy, but apparently not. You just have to be a loser. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've never played World of Warcraft. I've only actually seen it once. I saw someone's computer that happened to have it on. Yet I know who Leroy Jenkins is. Mm-hmm. And he's my hero. Second only to Omar Jenkins. Omar. <laughs> so there's a quote from uh, on Joystick about this particular incident. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a, and the guy said... Uh, this either says a lot about the spread of tired internet memes into the mainstream potato, or potato. about the question researchers' addictions. Hmm. Either way, it reflects the rise of gaming into popular perception while maintaining a huge divide between those who are in on the joke and those who aren't. Yeah, I can definitely see, say, ten years from now when we're all adults and there will be no chance for any of our uh, age peers to know who Leroy Jenkins was. Yeah, but I mean... This is really good about what's happening in general is that a lot there's a lot of geeks and we're having this sort of meta conversation on the internet. It's like this whole imagine if there was a newspaper that was printed that had completely different stories from the real newspaper and it only went to some people's houses and they never let anyone else read it. But you would still talk about it with other people who got the paper at the water cooler and everyone else would be like what's going on? All right, it's kind of like when you um you know, when people in the room are using PictoChat and some people aren't. You have this side channel of communication that isn't available to everyone. Yeah, and pe- some people are laughing about something and everyone else goes, what? What? Plus, it's just so nice to see this. Co- like when we went to Otakon, you know, 22,000 geeks running around. And I knew, and then I experimentally verified, that if I yelled Leroy, a lot of people would yell Jenkins. In fact, um... Just whispering about yelling Leroy, like, we're going to do it. Someone else will do it before you. (laughs) And then you will invariably respond with the Jenkins. Oh, really? Really. You know, it's like they're, I don't know. It's like kind of like an invasion. Yeah, geeks are kind of, we're slowly subverting. We're like taking culture and making our own like subculture. But our subculture is infiltrating the main culture. Yeah, but people still don't understand it or recognize that it's there. It's kind of like spying or like, remember in uh, Hannibal when he put the secret message in the classified ads to tell him what was going on? Normal people see it as a classified ad, but to the other guy, ah, evil Hannibal messages. But eventually, like the more they see it, they'll be scared and or confused by it possibly. Well, they've already begun to persecute the geeks. Yeah, Jack Thompson. Jack Thompson. Jack Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. Though Germany has its own Jack Thompson now, but he's in a government position, and he wants to ban violent video games. Well, we have people in our Senate and whatnot that want to get rid of violent video games all Yeah, but I don't think they really want to get rid of them. Like, Hillary Clinton periodically campaigns against them, but I think that's just a political ploy. Yeah, I think it's mostly political ploy. Yeah, this German guy seems kind of nutty. Like, he really wants to ban him, and his rationale was that it's basically it would remove the burden from parents who don't understand these games. Well, Germany's not big on freedom anyway. I mean, <laughs> no, 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 not like, well, kind of like that. Is You're not allowed to be Nazi there. Yeah. You, you, you know, Here Nazi you're stuff. allowed to be Nazi, you're just dumb. Yeah. It's like, you know, I, I don't like Nazis. You Illinois know. Nazis. But if you want to march down the street with your Nazi business, I don't care. You're not bo- you're not killing anyone. You're not doing anything. You're just walking around yelling. Yeah, First Amendment. And while, while you're an idiot, go for it. You know, if that's what you want to Though, say. Though, if the Blues Brothers happen to drive through their parade, I wouldn't stop them. I just laugh. Yeah, that that's pretty much what it comes down to. So, you know, Germany, sure, that was where the Nazis happened. So I can understand the wanting to keep it away, but the limiting freedom is kind of Nazi-ish. You know, it's, uh-huh. it's kind of like this backwards thing. So this is just, you know, a government that doesn't have freedom will have less qualms about taking away other freedoms. Yeah. Hmm. Even though that doesn't scare me nearly as much as what's going on in Britain now with the cars. What's going on in Britain with cars? In Britain, you know, they got the cameras everywhere. They've got cameras almost everywhere in Britain. Yeah, Just they watching do. everyone. Yep. 
and all about it. They even have that thing that can like see your face and match you up in the computer. Yep. And it just matches faces randomly and looks for uh, people who are in criminal databases and wanted. Well, lists. now they're setting up the system to do the same thing with car license plates. So it just, goal, they're just cameras looking at license plates all over, and if yeah. your license plate is in the database of bad, they come get you? Yeah, but, and also to uh, in real time enforce speeding without needing cops. They'll just they'll know if you got between two places too quickly. But then how will they know if that was uh, like the computer didn't malfunction or something? Ah, or... ah, well the computer's perfect. Can you at least go to court and say something? I assume you can go to court. The system's not in place yet, so I'm sure we're gonna see a lot of. Uh, Various court battles and fighting over it. So I don't know how Britain's courts work, but if that was a U.S. court, you'd find one way to get out of it. And then... Well, the thing is, I mean, right when the cameras first started going in, a lot of Brits protested him furiously. And they went in anyway, and eventually people got used to him and stopped fighting him, and now a lot of people are glad they're there. So they get used to these things real quickly, scarily quickly. Yeah, the cameras are there, great, but they don't help when, you know, the cops kill some guy in the subway. He shouldn't have been killed. <laughs> no, the, no, where the he, he might have been a terrorist, so it's okay. Well, where were the cameras then, huh? <laughs> I don't see the film from these things. Where is it? I wonder if a camera was pointed over there or not. There had to be. There's cameras everywhere in Britain. Yeah. Everywhere. Like, literally, just on every street, in every public place. They're just, they're not in your private place, as far as we know, but <laughs> they might be looking at your window. Yeah, which is perfectly legal. Yep. In fact, here in the United States, I can stand on the sidewalk and with a telephoto's lens get whatever I can through the windows. Perfectly yep. legal. Perfectly legal. In fact, I can even put those pictures on the interwebs. Interwebs. There's, you know, usually if you're seeing something going on in a house that, you know, is all eh, that you want to take pictures of, that's like, ooh, someone wants you to see. That uh, no one's dumb enough. I got to say, because in New York City, there seem to be a lot of people who are naked in the window, and they know they're naked, and they know everyone can see them, and they're doing it on purpose. A lot of people. There's no way you could be standing completely naked in front of a large window in a skyscraper where there's another skyscraper right across the street with people in it and not know that they can see you because you can see them. Yeah. There aren't too many people who stand in the window naked that don't want to be seen naked. Yeah. And Granted, oftentimes I'll stand in front of a window naked just because I'm not paying attention and it's early. This is why bathroom windows are very high up and small. <laughs> or they're made with that clouded glass. I don't like the clouded glass because I can't see out and it defeats the purpose of the window. What do you want to see out when you're in the bathroom? The window's there just to let the steam out after you shower. See what the weather's like. Uh, I have many other opportunities to see the weather. You know, like every other window I pass. I mean, while I'm standing out in the bathroom drying, I'm not doing anything else. I could look at the weather. I don't stand in the bathroom and dry. I walk right out of the bathroom. You get water all over the place. Uh, I use it. There's this thing someone invented. It was called a towel. Yeah, I dry myself off with a towel, then I leave the bathroom. So you're worried about occupying yourself for those, like, five seconds. Hey, and every little bit helps. <laughs> That'd be like if I played Mario Kart while I was walking to my car. I plead guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, when I was driving home from the train station today, I was kind of I had a little Mario Kart in the brain, and I was like, you know, going the outside, the inside, on the turn, back to the outside. I was getting ready to wiggle the wheel a bit. <laughs> yeah, the other day when I was driving to the drugstore or something, uh, there was a corner, and I had this urge to jump and then power slide. Yeah, it doesn't work. No, nah, <laughs> my car doesn't jump. My car doesn't jump either. <laughs> my car barely rolls. Mm. Yeah, so uh, it's going to be real hard for us to continue the podcast because my suspended DS is sitting right there, and I can see it blinking at me, and I know that I'm one click away from racing some crazy Japanese kid. Uh, yesterday, I played like a whole bunch of races. And I only lost once against a guy who was as good as me, and I lost basically by a hair on item luck. So I'm feeling pretty good. Most people just suck. Yeah, I like, noticed they don't most even people drift. don't seem to drift. A lot of people use the bunny hop method, where they just hop around every corner. Uh, there was one guy who wasn't as fast as I was, but he was. He found this shortcut on one track that I couldn't replicate. Which track? The Luigi, the the final Yoshi circuit, the last track. Ah. And he basically, I don't know what he did, but I tried to go to the same place he went, and there was a railing that stopped me from going. But he somehow jumped over this piece of the track, and I would get way ahead of him by going real fast. Then he would jump over, and he'd be in front of me, and then I'd have to pass him again. 
I still won, but it was it was like whoa. <laughs> Though I did see, and because we were talking the other day about the uh, things people will put in their little emblems in the game, I saw perhaps the most offensive one ever. Hmm? I don't think I need to elaborate. Let's just say that it was some form of intricately drawn penis with a racial uh, epithet attached. I, I spent the hours at where I was not working at work today, and I drew a boo. Oh, a boo? A boo. Ah, boo. Whee! It's pretty good. It's better than my previous logo, which is uh, lightning. Yeah, my current logo is a poorly drawn skull and bones. Yeah, you should draw a quality skull and bones. Yeah, this weekend I'm probably going to sit down and make something cool. You know, like those uh, those skulls in Mario where you step on them and they fall down. I or like, better or like that. they make a little platform that goes in the lava and you stand on it and they carry you along. Or I could just, you know, make the most offensive thing I can think of. Yeah, could. It's not that interesting, though. I mean, just just one final note. The guy who had the really offensive uh, emblem, his name also was uh, Fuck Fuck. Great name. I played the worst one. The only one I played against that was offensive was a guy whose name was Capital T Bagger with two capital G's in the middle of it. <laughs> and his icon, I think, oh, his icon was a green T-shirt with two yellow letters in the middle of it: the letter F and the letter U. Classic. What a what a uh, upstanding and eloquent young man. Yeah, he lost. Oh, me. great. Real bad. I, I whooped him. So we're having a hard time, you know, coming up with things to talk about. Monday and Thursday, because... Thursday is only tough because we uh, don't have any interviews lined up that we can go out and do just yet. Yeah, and it's a, it's hard to force ourselves to talk about something. We used to just kind of let it go, and trying to force it is not so difficult. So at the spur of the moment, I came up with a bit, and we decided to call this bit, at least temporarily, How Not to Suck with Vrim and Scott. And what I think we're going to, the way the bit's going to work is each episode of the bit, if we ever do another episode of the bit, is we just start saying how not to suck at something. And whatever the something is, we just keep coming up with advice, one sentence or a few sentences of advice on how not to suck, and then we elaborate. Yep. Until and, we're done describing. And we'll very specifically only pick things that we don't suck at. That way we have some sort of knowledge. But we don't suck at anything. Uh, we suck at sucking. Okay, maybe, but... <laughs> well, what we can do is, you know, while we're, all the bit is called How Not to Suck, we can only talk about things we're awesome at, uh, which is many, many things, but not <laughs> not all things. I'm not an awesome uh, cross-country skier. No, you're not. In fact, I don't even know how to cross-country ski. All I know is you put on skis and you walk around. It's actually kind of fun, but it's very uh, exerting. I think it's mostly sliding, right? See, this shows how much nah, I don't know about. No, nah, it. it's mostly it, it. It's hard, like rollerblading is hard, and that you do have you have to do a lot of work. It's mostly not downhill. Uh Anyway, the first one we're gonna do is the easiest one: how not to suck at college. college. The first rule of not sucking at college is the two-thirds rule, number part one. The two-thirds rule is there are three things in college life: you're sleeping. You're having fun, and your grades in your classes. If you pick any two of those, you will succeed. You cannot have all three unless they're all pretty weak. You pretty much get, you know, you can have a, you, you know, you can have sleep, sleep all you want, never be tired. You can have tons of fun, and you you won't pass your classes, or any other combination. We pretty much gave up sleep. Yeah, getting uh, giving up sleep is what I would recommend. Because that way, you I, pretty much, we picked fun no matter what. And then we'd give up sleep to get good grades. Every now and then, when we needed sleep, we'd temporarily give up grades to get sleep. Because yeah. fun is pretty much our number one priority all the time. We always maximize the fun. And then, you know, I had a little bit of sleep, but that took out a little bit of grades. That's why I didn't get a 4.0. Yep. Like, I remember the time when we just said fuck all and drove to Michigan to go to this Linux convention, PenguinCon. Well, I was, I, I was working at the time. I wasn't in school. Yeah, but I was in school, and I had a project due that Monday that pretty much if I passed it, I would graduate. And if I didn't pass it, I wouldn't graduate. So what I do? I went to PenguinCon. And then I got back Sunday night, and I stayed up all night and worked furiously and finished the project. And uh, then I slept through, like, my next week worth of classes. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't even talk about how many times where I had fun all night, didn't sleep, and then went to class the next day. <laughs> I mean, if that's not fun in grades with no sleep, I don't know what is. 
Now, the other rule along these lines is very simple. It is how to pass a class. You are guaranteed to pass the class with at least a low B, if not higher, if you do two of the three following things. Actually attend the class. And pay attention. If you attend the class and sleep, that doesn't count. Yeah, but if you attend the class and just kind of hang out in the back and don't really pay attention, but you don't sleep straight up, you're fine. Yeah, it helps a little bit, but actually paying attention is the best. Yeah. Do your homework. Very important. Or study. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, uh, we never studied, ever. I never studied ever. Yeah. I, ha- I You know, when I was in elementary school and they said, oh, study for the test, I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I, <laughs> I knew it meant you do something to prepare to get a better grade on the test, but I didn't know specifically what you did. I was like, what What could I do? I already get 100 without doing anything. Yeah. It's like I, I, I didn't understand it, and I never took notes, and... Up until the end of college, I never studied and never took notes, and I now have a degree. But you can use this rule to your advantage to, to modify or uh, take advantage of how much time you get living. Like, I had a class once where it was visual basic, and I realized I didn't need to go to it. So I decided to never go to the class, and I just learned visual basic on my own by you know studying and doing homework. And as a result, I passed the class. One important thing to also note about this rule is if there is homework that is graded, like a project, that's that's pretty much mandatory. Yeah. That's that's considered, you know, it's a test, you have to take it. It's a project, you have to do it. See, we were lucky at RIT. Very few people ever assigned homework. It was always either one big paper or there was, like, daily homework that was worth maybe 5 or yeah. 6% of your grade. Yeah, if something is graded, I always did it. But I never did homework that wasn't graded, and I never did – I hardly ever did reading homework unless it was for literature class and I hadn't read the book. See, I went one step further. I would only do homework if I could – because remember, RIT did not have pluses and minuses. It was A, B, C, D, fail. So most people at RIT shoot for the low B because the low B is still a B, and it's the minimum effort required to mm-hmm. get a decent grade. Some teachers put the B at 83, but what are you going to do? Yeah. But, uh, crap. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I'd look at the syllabus whenever a class started, and I'd see, like, oh, the final is worth 60%, and the midterm is worth 20%, and the project's worth X, and, oh, the the labs are only worth 8% of my final grade? So if I don't do any of the labs, I can still get an A. If I I don't do any of the labs, and I do okay on the test, I'll guarantee to B. Fuck the labs! It's funny how that often works out, where the labs will be the most time-consuming thing there is. And yet they're worth nothing. Yeah. Except in some IT classes where they're worth nothing, except they're a Boolean modifier to your final grade. Yeah, if you don't pass them, they you multiply fail. Your, your, they multiply your final grade by the integer result of the Boolean. Mm. If you fail the labs, they multiply your grade by zero. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> That was the one time I ever failed a class because I didn't do the lab. But it was a very conscious decision. It was well after the ad drop date. It was well after the withdraw date. And there were still three weeks left of class. <laughs> and I had kind of been slacking off all quarter. And I realized that, huh, I have a choice now. I can lose the next three weeks of my life and not have any fun but pass this class and get a good, pretty good grade. Or I can just say, screw it right now have fun for the next three weeks, and then retake the class the next quarter. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I just stopped going. It was fantastic. The one class I remember at RIT is the class I skipped more than any other class ever. I, so much to the point I don't remember the class. What it, class it, was it? It was software engineering. Software engineering had a big lab component that went for the whole quarter, and it had a, a, a uh, lecture component that lasted for two, uh, two-thirds of the quarter or a little over half the quarter. I think six or seven weeks, right? And basically at the end of the lecture part of the quarter, you took a final, and that was the end of the lecture. And you just kept going to the lab, right? The lab counted for most of the grade, and that one test counted for a lot of the rest of your grade, right? I went to, like, the first lecture and the second lecture and maybe, like, one random lecture. Other than that, I skipped it all the time. I, like, I feel, I kind of feel bad about it. (laughs) Like, I never went. There was just no attendance. And it didn't have homework, you know, and I studied a little bit for that test, and I did okay on it, and that was that. Yeah. It was so, uh. I guess the moral here is just that don't 
you don't have to always shoot for the perfect A, because if you do, you won't enjoy yourself in college. And it's possible to get good grades without doing all the work they give you. Be smart about it. Min-max. If something's not worth a large portion of your grade and it's too much work, don't do it. Yep. You're better off spending that time working on other classes that matter more. You also have to look at your the, your overall grade in the grand scheme. I mean, if you get a – how much extra work will it take you to move from the easy B to the difficult A in, like, a calculus class? And what effect will that have on the rest of your life? Is Especially that... if it would take you half as much work to get an A in another yeah. class that you're more interested in. If, instead. You're tr- if you're trying to be a mathematics PhD, maybe the A is really important. If you're trying to get a bachelor's degree in computer science, maybe the A isn't that important. And you should just – there's not even a point in doing the work because it you don't get anything out of it. Yep. And if you really want to know calculus, you can learn it. You can learn all that stuff without going through the extra effort of trying to get an A in the class. Yeah. The grade does not often reflect how much you learn about the subject. Yeah. I can speak from that very, very uh, openly. There are many times <laughs> where I could take a class and I knew everything that was going on in that class, but because of the format of the class or the type of tests that were given or the way the grading was done, I got a very bad grade. <laughs> there are also classes where I didn't learn anything and I got an A. Yeah, like all the all the late IT classes are kind of dumb. They were all about like tech tra- They were called cool things, but they were actually just like crap team building exercises. Oh, team building. Yeah. Yeah, that'll always mess up your grade working on a team. Because uh, the thing is, your teammates will usually be pretty dumb. Even though every individual person you know in that class is smart, there'll be this kid that you've never like seen in class before. He'll show up one one day. And you'll find out that he, you're on a team with him and, like, two other mystery people. I was on an awesome team once in ad hoc networking. And I was that was, that was like, my last quarter at RIT. I was on the awesomest team of us. But before that, every team was crap. So I guess my advice here is if you're ever on a team with people in a class and you didn't get to pick and the people in the team are dumb, if anyone isn't pulling their weight, just first warn them. That way you won't get in trouble with the professor. And then just... Ignore them. If they're not going to do the work, don't bother them. Just do the work yourself and then tell the professor, yo, this guy's a dick and we, he didn't help. Yep. And he'll get graded accordingly and you'll get graded accordingly. And don't don't let people grab your coattails and follow you in. Make them fail. Yeah, the other thing is when it's time to pick teams, even if you don't know anyone in the class, don't be all eh. You know who the smart people in the class are just looking around the room, and you know who you can communicate with and work well with. Yeah, pick... if you hesitate at all, you'll be stuck with everyone else who hesitated. Yeah, go and pick the good people right away. And if there's a good person who's kind of eh, like they're smart and they can do it, but they're not, you you have to take – don't you know expect someone else to be the leader, and you can just get some work assigned to you and do it. You have to be the leader guy every time. If you don't, you're going to basically... If you're crap. not you're, the leader guy You're just time. rolling dice for your grade, basically. Yeah. you got to take it into your own hands. Also, one trend I noticed in all the like group presentations I did throughout all of college, being funny matters a lot more than your actual content. And if you do something that's at all creative, and you do it confidently, and you do it humorously in front of the class, you'll get a good grade, even if the content itself is actually kind of ill-researched and or crappy. Yeah, I, I did that a lot. I didn't do too many presentations, but I would always do a funny thing if I was ever in front of the class. So just like in that uh, ad hoc networking class I just mentioned, we had to give presentations every week, right? And a lot of people had you know, projects that were a lot more complicated than ours was or a lot more science-y or a lot more math-y, you know? And they did a lot more work and talked a lot more about fancy things. We made a game... That was ad hoc networked. It was just a lot like Atari Combat. And we just showed live demos of people with tanks driving around shooting each other. And that <laughs> that uh, got a lot better grade than a lot of the other people. Because <laughs> honestly, when they make you do a group project in, a, in most schools, even tech schools, even in extremely advanced, like high-level graduating tech classes... They're not really grading you on your ability to do the tech because you got that far. They know you can do the tech, or they know you BS your way through it. They don't care. They're grading you on uh, how well you can communicate. Mm-hmm. They won't say that, but that's all they really care about. 
Well, it's also that, you know, when someone's watching you do a presentation, they really can't keep track of your uh, what the information you're presenting. That's why they have you do a paper that goes with it. Yep. Well, they're also usually really bored. I mean, no one in class is actually listening to you. They're either thinking about their own project, or they're imagining uh, sexual things, or they're just asleep with their eyes open. Yeah, I, I tried to pay attention to pretty much every lecture and presentation. I gave up right away. I realized I just couldn't. But I, I ended up only remembering and paying attention to the good ones, and the other ones, just whatever. Yeah. I actually hated watching the bad ones, because I'd, I'd cringe. It just felt so bad to watch someone floundering in front of a crowd of people. It, I also had the cringe effect going on real heavy. Of course, sometimes I had the asshole effect, where they'd always take questions at the end, and I'd pressure them about a point they weren't very clear on and they obviously hadn't researched i would pressure them but only if they said something that was just flat out wrong i yeah. wouldn't pressure them for being weak like just kind of going eh. i would pr i would hit them though if they said something that was wrong <laughs> they did something wrong i'd be like what you said was wrong here's my evidence ah. what do you say we just copied this off a website. We didn't actually really research. Oh, no. Yeah, we got one kid. This was, I mean, web is cracked now. But when I took this class, it was a networking class, an advanced, like, wireless one. And web at that time was not cracked. No one can say it was cracked back then because it would. It, there was really no way to crack web back then. Brute, for, brute force always worked. Yeah, brute force did, but even then it took hours and hours and hours. Back in those days, yeah. Yeah, this was, this was years ago. Mm -hmm. And this kid was doing a presentation on wireless security. And he was talking about how, yeah, web is totally insecure and there are cracks out there. You can just crack it in like five minutes. And luckily I didn't even have to raise my hand because the entire class, including the professor, right away was like, ah, uh, no. <laughs> You got any evidence of that? I'd like to see it. Probably win some award. Well, he wouldn't have won an award. I mean, he was right, you know, but I don't know where he got it from five years ago. Maybe it was like... Uh, I think he made it up, because I know that I made a lot of things up in presentations. No, uh, I, I never made any things up. I didn't not remember. in tech presentations, like not IT classes, but in my public speaking classes and my speech giving classes. Oh, yeah, because then it's not about the information. It's yeah, well, plus then the people in those classes tended to be like freshmen in other softer majors who didn't know or care. Yeah, I never made anything up in a, in a class. I made stuff up on the AP test, too, because I knew they couldn't read them. Uh, they only got 30 seconds to read your responses, so I made up books and then I cited them. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> and the on the advice of my uh, teacher, actually. Oh. Pretty cool teacher. Yeah. Our school has been accused more than once of cheating at the AP test, but they can't prove it. Maybe because they only spent 30 seconds reading it. Yeah. If you think they looked at it for a minute, they'd be like, oh, they did cheat. No, no, because what are they going to do? Go look up uh, Theodore Stromwell's book, uh, A History of British Politics? Yeah, and they'll find out it doesn't exist, and then they'll call you a cheater. No, nah, no, nah, because they have to prove it doesn't exist. I'm sure in the time it would take them to find out that it didn't exist, I could whip up a copy of that book. What if the book doesn't exist? Actually, we did that in, God, um, this is back in high school. I think it was 11th grade. Some, it wasn't me, but it was a friend of mine, and I helped him do it. He had to do a presentation on this obscure author, and there wasn't much information on the author online. There wasn't much information on many things online back then compared to today. And the library at school had crap. So the guy just made it all up, and he cited some website. And then at the end of class, the teacher calls him over and asks him, hey, uh, I tried to go to that website you linked to, and the link's dead. So he said, oh, I must have given you the wrong link. Let me go home, and I'll email you the right link. And he went home, and he grabbed me, and I made him a page with all the fake info on it. And I put it up on GeoCities, and then he gave the teacher the link. That's pretty awesome. This was back before teachers really knew what that Internet thing was or how to use it. That, if you did that today, you would be so screwed. Yeah, but back then, ha-ha. <laughs> All right, so other ways not to suck at college. Go outside, have friends. Going outside to having friends is very key. If you just think that friends are going to come along, that's not going to work. You need to go and find like-minded people and talk to them. Yes. And don't try to do it with, like, a frat or some other kind of pay to have friends group you have to find some genuine friends or else you know after college you're just never going to see these people again yeah they won't be real friends they're just like it's like prostitute friends almost and there's nothing wrong with drinking in college but don't be that guy Woo! Woo! you
you know him. He's half naked. He's got one of those red plastic cups full of beer that he spilled all over. And he's running around outside your dorm at 3 a.m. going, woo! Yeah, don't be that guy. I mean, it's like, sure, everyone at college does it, whatever, but actually, not so many. It's just that guy who does it. Yeah, it just no one realizes it. And (laughs) he just stands out so much that you think it's so in, but no. Nah, nah. Most people who drink in college aren't that guy. Mm. I've noticed, though, all the people who drink too much and cause trouble with alcohol in college are the ones who had never had alcohol before college, and then they just go crazy. Or the people where their parents just didn't let them do anything, and now they're at college, they let loose. Yeah. I mean, like, when I was a little kid, you know, my mom wouldn't let me eat the peanut butter or the butter out of the... Oh, if you got a hold of that peanut butter? Yeah, I would have just eaten it all right out of the freaking jar, right? But I said, man, as soon as I'm out of here, I'm going to eat a whole jar of peanut butter. But by the time I was out of there, I was so smart, I didn't. I knew that eating the jar of peanut butter was a bad idea. <laughs> you know, but it's like these kids were like, as soon as I'm out of here, I'm going to drink myself stupid. And then as soon as they got out of there, they drank themselves stupid. Yep. Well, I think they were stupid before. That That's why they drank so much. <laughs> uh, ask girls out. Asking girls out is good. Because uh, all I'll really say about that is that most people... Well, I guess the only... To put it very bluntly, girls like boys just as much as boys like girls. And when you're out of college... It's a lot harder to find girls that are your age to ask out, and a lot harder <laughs> to find situations in which asking them out is appropriate. Yeah, I noticed you're having some trouble on that front. I'm not really looking too hard, but, you know. Yeah. Mr. Penis is always on. <laughs> Never tires. Well, in general, not just girls, it's hard to meet people when you're out of college who are like-minded. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, in college, you go to the gaming club, and there's a million geeks playing games, and you make friends for life. You go to the anime club, and there's a million geeks watching anime, and you make oh, friends for life. Oh, it's a geek college. But even if you're not a geek, if you go you to... You join the theater group, and you meet a bunch of theater-type people, and they're friends for life. Yeah. Even if you're at, like, some normal state school, you know, some sport you play, or even an intramural sport. I mean, my brother does intramural dodgeball, and he met a bunch of people there. Yeah. You know, kind of random, but it works. Because really, once you get out of college... It's hard to meet new people, and a lot of the people you meet are not as cool as you would like them to be. Mostly because they've been out of college, and they haven't been doing cool stuff. A lot of people leave college, and they give up, and they become uncool. And we'll probably have another uh, how not to suck about that. How to not suck after college? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. An important thing to do in college is always to uh, not suck with money. Yeah, we have a... God, we have a friend of ours... Someone we know. Named who, you who got his car repoed. Nah, uh, yeah, but that was more because uh, the money stopped coming in from sources that I was expecting it to come in from for a long time. Mm, don't do that. Yeah, but we had a friend who uh, didn't have any money, and then he got some money from a student loan, and instead of buying, you know, food or books, brought a drum set. Real useful. Does he, did he at least play the drums? As far as I heard, no. Yeah, just wasting money. Yeah, I, Trying I don't get that. Trying to buy a little social currency and then not spending the social <laughs> currency. I'll convert my real currency to social currency, which I will not spend. See, at least we had another friend who had the uh, projector in his apartment as social currency. Well, but that yeah. was not the only currency he had. No, it was not the only currency he had. And also, he had the money to buy the projector. He, yes, he and also buy food. Mm-hmm. And this not only was the projector great social currency, but, you know, it also was very entertaining. Yeah. Like, for real. Not just, like, you know, something to show. Like, come look at my thing, and then you start a conversation, and then you're done. It's, hey, keep coming to my house because I have the thing. Yeah. In fact, after – because our house was kind of the hangout place, just it, because we were the ones that had the most furniture. Mm, and then when we left, nice. his house became the hangout place. And then he left, and now it's it's all in the air. Because we're the old men who don't go there anymore. Mm. Don't be old men. Oh, wait. Don't get old. That doesn't work. (laughs) Another important thing to do in college is keep track of what's going on. If you're not on tap to the events happening in the school and the news in the school and the news in the world, a lot of things are going to pass you by. Yeah. I mean, there are funny things happening and, and awesome things happening at colleges more than anywhere else. And if you don't try to find them, you're just going to miss all of them, and it's it's going to suck. Yep. 
I mean, all just all these cool things you learn by finding out like the secret passages because there were secret passages at RIT and we found them because mm. we met people who knew about them or like the cool hidden club that meets after hours somewhere or the freaking dodgeball club that just plays dodgeball every day. Yep. I mean, but it's even other stuff, like, we saw that we, the thing of the day a while ago was the uh, video of, like, Pac-Man running into a chemistry lab. You know, if you can keep track of stuff like that, then you can go around and see those sorts of funny things happening at your school all the time. Or, or take one step further and be that guy. Yeah, you can be that guy. That's even better. We were several times close to that guy. Yep, but if you hide in the dorm all day, just minding your own business, doing your homework... You'll never see those things, and college will be a lot less fun than it is because the fun will be behind wall. But it'll be you and a wall in between you and the fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wall between you and the fun, and if <laughs> you don't peek around the wall, you're going to have a lot less fun. Like, if you're into German board games and you play with your four friends in your dorm every night, that's fun. But if you're just going to play the board game anyway, go play it in the like middle of some building somewhere on campus. And a million people walk by, and what's that? Ooh, and then you'll meet more people. Yeah, add, you know, get your social currencies worth out of your board game, and at the same time, something cool might happen there that you'll see. Yeah, that's how we met a lot of our friends, by, by indulging in our geekeries publicly, and other people who had interest in those geekeries came to see what all the hubbub was and joined our little rolling katamari of geek culture. <laughs> And that was Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Thanks for listening. Please remember to point your favorite podcatcher at feeds.feedburner.com slash geeknights to get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. Also, please visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com for the latest updates and forum discussions. And whether you love or hate our podcast, we won't know unless you send your feedback to us at geeknights at gmail.com.